Welcome to Travel Baseball Coach Justin Podcast. Travel Baseball Coach Justin interviews travel baseball coaches, tournament directors, and former players from around the nation. Here's Travel Baseball Coach Justin. Hello, welcome to Travel Baseball Coach Justin Podcast. I'm Travel Baseball Coach Justin, and today I'm here with uh, Patrick McCormick from the South Medford Panthers 10U Travel Ball team. Hello, Patrick. How you doing? Hey, good, Justin. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, hey, Patrick, can you give us a little uh, history about you? Yeah, uh, just real brief. Uh, I'm a 10U baseball coach here in South Medford, Junior Panthers. We're a program of 60 kids that take the kids from 10U all the way through 14U. Uh, I started last year when my son was nine and, and my second year coaching at the 10U level. Also a board member out at the local Little League and have coached baseball for many years. Nice, nice. So to kind of figure out what your 10 team's doing, um, how long is your season typically, you know, from start to finish? You know, uh, we have two seasons. Uh, we have a spring season that starts uh, January and goes through the first week in June. Um, around mid-May, we start uh, scouting slash uh, trying out for a summer fall team. Um, some kids only stay on for the spring season, and then uh, some kids stay on all the way through. Uh, for the summer fall which will end at the end of October so we'll go June through October that's a long season for those kids from January to October that's nice so how many tournaments um, do you think you're going to have in about a year in both seasons Uh, last year we had 13 tournaments and we're anticipating about the same well that's good that's 39 games with three game guarantees and so let's see here and you I imagine you guys are scrimmaging throughout the season with the other teams Correct. Yep. About how many games a year are you guys playing? Uh, I I imagine we probably have 15 scrimmages mixed in there. All right. Well, you put you about 55, 56 games. That's a lot of experience for boys at 10 U. I think that's great. Um, They're just going to get better and better and better the more they play. Um, So since you're a travel ball team, how far are you guys going to travel like cities and that kind of stuff? Where where are you, where are you headed out outside of Medford? Yeah, so our, our spring season, we travel to Redding, California, about three hours south, um, and then we'll go over to Klamath Falls, about two hours east of here. Um, nice. Outside of that, our spring consists of mainly tournaments here in our hometown of Medford. Where we're yeah, first. Lithia and Driveway Fields. That's Gotta it. love that complex. Yeah. All right, and then how many kids do you have on the team, your team specifically? I know you said 60 for the program. Yeah, we have 12 on our 10U team. Perfect. And then are you an older 10 or a younger 10 Because, you know, 10 is kind of like when people start travel ball. Yeah, so we're an older 10 uh, So we go by grade. So they're either going to be in third or fourth grade. Um, but we're older as far as experience. Eight of our 12 kids played as a nine-year-old last year. So. Oh, wow. And then they're going to be playing 10 again this year? That's it. Yep. Oh, man, they're going to dominate. <laughs> yeah, that's the hope. <laughs> that's oh, yeah. Hope. Well, They'll, let's just say their experience will uh, get them through a lot of games where you're, you're holding on. <laughs> yeah. I've been there. <laughs> oh, man. So what are the challenges you're finding um, as a coach with the players right now? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the main challenges at 9 slash 10U, and I know you can relate a little bit, is is just keeping them on point during practices. And, I mean, you've really got to be – consistent with your practice plans you can't just throw things together last minute you really got to have a bunch of different options for the kids to get them through practices keep them engaged things like that Um, at this age group they're still nine and ten year old kids that are staring off into space watching the traffic go by on the highway to next to the field things like that so so uh, keeping kids engaged is really critical to their development in my opinion well if you're doing that, it sounds like you probably have more than how many coaches do you have on the practice field at any one time? Uh, typically, we have three to five coaches at every right. practice. Right. And then you break them up. And you constantly keep them moving that. No, that's that's the best uh, mix I've seen that, that works. Uh, we do three to four stations as well. The kids are always moving. If they're not moving, it's usually two to three kids at a station and they're always doing something. That's great. Um, so uh, coaching your son uh, has is that been a challenge? Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, you know, I mean, you got to take your coach hat off and put your dad hat on from time to time. And uh, it, it's a challenge because I feel like uh, in my world, coaches, kids, uh, they have a hard, you know, because there's the expectations. 
uh, dad's going to extra games all the time and he's always in the car getting dragged around watching your team's games or other teams right. games. And, and, and so, uh, ba- baseball is, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that he's happy watching baseball games and being out at the baseball field, but yeah, it's, it's tough coaching him just because it, you got to have that right level. You got to treat him like one of the other players. And, I, and right. I struggle with that a little bit. I have high expectations for my own kid more than others because there's the parenting, the coaching, everything. And, and that's tough. You hit it. Right. Have you ever uh, tried to get coach him on something and he just doesn't want anything to do with it? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, okay. uh, okay. I, 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 we, we've come to my assistant coach also has a kid on the team and a lot of times we'll coach the other uh, coach's son instead of us coaching our own kids right. for that exact reason. Right. No, I, I learned that about four years ago when we started the bucks in the fall season, as I noticed uh Newt's boy and Travis's boy and, and Josh's kids, th- these are all their coaches. They weren't listening to what their dad was saying. And so I would just repeat what their dad was saying. And then they'd be like, Oh, this is the first time I've heard it. It's just <laughs> like good information. And I, once I noticed that I was like, Oh my gosh, I started going up to them. I said, Hey, can you, can you tell my boy Adler to do this? And all of a sudden it was like, it it was like they flipped a switch and the kid totally resonates. It's like, I've heard that many times before, but no, this is the first time I've ever heard from you. (laughs) Right. And then then they gravitate towards that. So we got a little sneaky and we just start, you know, going up and they weren't, no, they didn't know what was going on. They're nine, 10, you know, you just go up there and you kind of whisper in their ear and five, 10 minutes later, they walk by and they go, Hey, fix that. And then it's done. It's, Oh, that's the best part. That's the best part. Figuring that little uh, trick out as a travel ball coach when you're a dad as well, because in our in their lives, we tell them because we're rearing them and raising them. We tell them stuff all the time, what to do and what not to do. So when we're on the ball field, they're like, enough. I mean, you yeah. know what I mean? From us. So, yeah, that's so um, since this is your second year, um, is there a team out there considered your nemesis and or one that you haven't beaten that you're just like, I want to get by them. I want to beat them. You know, there hasn't, we will have to wait till the season to really establish that because we played a lot of teams last year with older kids. So most of those yeah. kids now have transitioned out to the 11 U bracket and only a few squads out there um, kind of remain from what we saw in our local area. We've, really struggled against the Ashland Grizzlies. Um, okay. We, we scrimmage them quite a bit. So they see us a bit. Uh, we see them quite a bit. Uh, and we just really struggled against a few of their pitchers, a few of their kids um, and have made some real critical mistakes against them. And I wouldn't consider them a nemesis, but I, it sure would be nice to get over that hump this year. Right. No. Nemesis. Yeah. The not a nemesis, but you know, just one of those teams where you just, it's hard to beat for some mm-hmm. reason. And you're like, you're looking at knowing that these kids can play well and you know that they can beat probably this team consistently, but they just don't No, It's just, it's one of those things. Uh, we just had one this last tournament and uh, it's battle born out of, uh, out of Nevada. We saw them in a Reno tournament last year and they beat us. Uh, it was two to two going into the last inning. And we had three uh, double plays line drives literally. And the base runners did everything right but first base twice where he caught it going towards the bag and stepped on the bag. There's nothing the base runner could do on a secondary lead. Absolutely. And then one up the middle where the second baseman was holding the kid on and then a line drive right over the pitcher's head, base hit all day, 99 out of a hundred times. But the second baseman was literally two steps off the bag, catches it. Boom, bang, bang gets, oh. and they got out of the inning all three times. So we lost that game. And then they ended up, I mean, you know what happens at 10, you, you kind of get down, they, they get the momentum going, they beat a six to two. And then this last uh, weekend we were in um, Sparks, Nevada playing them. And we just took mental dumps in both games. And I'm like sitting here, I'm like, I'm spinning because it's hard. I don't know how to coach when the team takes a mental dump. You know what I mean? It's just, it's like everybody's looking every which different directions. Um, we even had a pitcher throw the ball literally over the backstop. And up oh. into the second story, um, <laughs> it was kind of amazing because you're like, did that just happen? Yep, that happened. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it was uh, no names, of course, protect the innocent. Of course. But uh, it was it was it was really comical. I mean, I, I actually laughed it off. I was just like, sure, why not? If it's going to be any game, let's do this. Let's do it against this team, you know. Let, let's do it in February. Get it out of the way. 
Yeah. Yeah. So are there uh, any coaching rituals? I mean, I have mine, like before the game, like the night before, right before the game. Are there any coaching rituals that you do? Oh, man. I, I always write up the lineup card the night before. Huh. I, I sleep on I, it, right? It, yep. Yep. I'm, uh, I'm going to write out the lineup card the night before. And I, I find myself early last year, I see a kid warming up. And I'm like, oh, no, maybe I should push him down in the lineup or maybe I shouldn't put him out in the field. But realistically, I came to realize that these kids, once the, they go into game mode, they're not taking it easy with a warm up throw or anything like that. You know, the kids that are going to flip the switch and really put pedal to the metal and play hard for you. Um, like I said, I've coached eight of these 12 kids for at least two seasons, some three or four. And you just got to trust it. You just got to trust that the best version of those kids is going to show up on game day. And if they don't, they don't, they're, they're 10 years old, right? They're, yeah. They're, they're all going to have bad days, but to your point, I still like if they're taking mental dumps, it's hard to get a team to reset and mid game and go back out and compete. Like it's a zero zero game. If they're, they're down earlier they they don't have a couple plays that go their way. Yeah. And I want to get back to Battleborn um, only because I want to say that they're a really, really well coached team and the kids are really good. It's just we haven't brought our A game against them yet. That's what frustrates me. It's like, man, they haven't seen our A game, you know, but that's what teams do, man. When they get when they got you, they got you. And that's the first team we've ever gone 0 and 3 against. Um, and, you know, it irks me. They're not my yeah. nemesis. I like both our coaches. Uh, uh, Bob and I forget the other gentleman's name. Um, but anyway, um, yes. Uh, but with, uh, coaching rituals, mine is caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, uh, I get up in the morning. I always wait an hour to let the adenosine get through the body. It's a chemical that, um, your body reabsorbs and, uh, I pop a double, double. So I usually do a double shot of espresso. I have an espresso machine finish that and I do another one right after it and then I'm good until game time which then I go to my trusty Celsius which has 200 milligrams of caffeine it's one of these little things I'm not promoting this I don't get paid by them but um, it's soda water I love soda water um, but it has caffeine in it and so and then all the flavors are good there hasn't been a bad flavor yet which is kind of weird because normally flavors are chemicalized and whatnot and I don't know mm -hmm. if it is or not but um, I usually pound one of those about an hour before the game because um, I'll probably make you smile right now because the kids come up with so many questions. Yeah, Like they just pepper. I mean, it's like they have an Uzi and they just go and then they just pound all these questions at you. If I'm not caffeinated for that, I could get a little <laughs> irritable on my end. So I do this. I, I say I do it for the children, which sounds like a crock, but no, it's serious. It, it, it is. It's for, it's to keep me in. It's to keep me sane. And then um, I get to, you know, sip while I, you know, work with them on the tea, you know, pregame and everything like that. And then um, the other ritual is I usually just pop one of those and go straight to soda water or water during the game. But then I do because, uh, you know, Saturdays, you usually have a round robin. A lot of times the games are back to back or there's only one game in between where you have to wait. And so I have another post game slash pregame one of either the Starbucks mocha double shot, which is this huge one, but it only has 135 milligrams. But I, I usually go back to another Celsius uh, to get the 200 to kind of get me back up because usually you're taking a caffeine dump. And so um, I do that and then it's just play ball. So, <laughs> but that's it. I mean, it gets you ready. Yeah, it gets me ready. And it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's um, uh, superstition like a lot of us have in baseball. I believe a lot of the superstitions come from having to focus so hard on this game, whether it's offense, defense, your situations, every routine that has to go through. But um, when I played, I always had the superstition, don't step on the line until I made an error and then I kicked through the line. So, but that was my superstition. It's like, okay, <laughs> hey, I, I, hey, I kept that chalk clean for you, baseball field. Not anymore, you know? So it was, but what it does is it keeps you like mentally engaged. So for me, it's focus. That's the reason why I like rituals. If I see a kid do one, I'm like, what's that for? I usually talk to them and stuff. So anyway. Hey, so, so on that yeah. note, if you don't mind me asking, uh, how do you handle that downtime in a, in a round robin? Say you got a, a 9 a.m. game and then a 1 p.m. game. You got a one game gap in between. How do you handle that? Okay. So you, you brought it up earlier. You said game mode, right? 
Right. So once we're done with the game, we usually have a conversation, not always when there's two games back to back. Um, the boys kind of know what they did. But at that point in time, it's it's fun time. So you can't hold game mode um, unless you're back to back together. So if there's a gap, it's always like have fun. I'll crack jokes to some of the kids intentionally, you know, kind of take them out of the game mode, relax the brain, that kind of stuff. And then they know when we start hitting and everything, I'm, I'm, I'm the hitting coach. So I get to sit there with the tee and talk to them as they're stroking the ball. And, and I, I sit there and I get them to do their, their proper work. And then we work up into the full swing to where they just hit the ball and don't even think about mechanics. And during that time, I tell them, I said, Hey, okay. All right. When you go out off the whiffles or taking fly balls or whatever, do everything right. Get into game mode. Just start, getting down that runway so when we hit the game you're airborne we're not we're not reacting we're, we're we are just we're we're predicting hey that ball's gonna be their crush uh, that ball's coming to me at third or second short whatever i want it so that's how i do i i do it um the other coaches dan jason and antonio that they, they got other things that they do i mean but for me it's playtime because they want to talk to their buddies. They want to talk about their game. They want to talk about to the parents, you know, Hey, did you see me do that? I don't want them serious because when they're serious for that long, then, they, then they fade out in mm -hmm. the game. You see them fade out in the games. Um, so I like to flip the switch into fun time. Like, Hey, go, okay. go get something to eat. Go, go do whatever. So, yeah. So um, when is your next tournament coming up? Our tournament is um, about, what 13 days away now uh march march 11th is uh first tournament here in medford so we'll be uh we'll be out there uh march 11th and 12th here uh, with the driveway fields pretty excited. any of the any of the teams in the tournament um you guys played last year kind of like you where they were a younger 10 you and then they're an older 10 you this season yeah so there's a few squads there that we played last year um looking forward to matching up with them uh you know it in our world right now, there's two different types of 10 U teams and, and age brackets, really. There's there's teams like ours that are directly affiliated to a high school where we are strict by grade. Fourth grade is 10 U, fifth grade is 11 U, sixth grade is 12 U. And then there's club teams where it's it's just age, right? Like May 1st cutoff is the cutoff. Right. So it, whatever age you are, even if you're a fifth or a sixth grader that qualifies for 10 U, you're playing. Um, and so one of those uh, club teams around here is uh, Playball Prospects Gas right. House, um, and and they're returning about half of that 10U team from last year, and it feels like we played them probably seven times last year, and they're in the first tournament, so that'll be one of those squads that I'm sure are in our near future. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. So will there be, since you're an older 10U team, will there be a more aggressive approach to um, some of the game, uh, some of the points in the game that you probably weren't able to do last year because you're still foundational building? hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, we're working on stuff right now in February that we barely touched even with our summer ball team. Um, we're working on pitcher cuts and things like that and first base cuts and think weird things that are intricacies of the game that need to be learned. But if you throw it at a nine-year-old in his first year of travel ball, it's probably just going to get lost. So uh, we're right. implementing more, um, more signs, more plays, um, things like that. And and listen, they're not perfect yet. We don't expect them to be for perfect in the first uh, tournament of the season for them, but we expect them to at least be able to execute some things that maybe they weren't last year. Right, right. What about uh, base stealing? Much more aggressive this year? 100%, yeah. I mean, our, our jumps and our leads, are go that we've drilled that in. I think um, what we've been practicing, oh, geez, since the first week in January, and there hasn't been a week where we didn't devote some time to base running. We, If we're going to win um, baseball games, we're going to need to run hard, especially at 10U. You, you got to put pressure on a catcher. You got to find out. I mean, we'll make them prove themselves before, uh, oh, before, yeah. you, you, before you let off the gas there. Yeah, I'm the hitting coach and the third base coach, which means base stealing. Yeah. So I don't. I can't tell you. I can't press upon anybody that the more runs that you can get is all based off of how many bases you can steal. Because if you can steal that base, get there, then there's a pass ball. Now you're on third. Other teams would be like they didn't take that first pitch or second pitch, and then there's a pass ball. Now they're on second. Then there's another pass ball. Well, the one on third scores. One on second gets to third. So 
You know that you've seen yep. it. It's frustrating. You're like, you should have stole. I gave you the sign. <laughs> yeah, whatever your sign is. We've been there. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no. Um, awesome. Hey, uh, have you played in um, like in Medford? It's kind of weird because uh, we play all around and other tournaments will actually do what's called. An, uh, if you if there's eight teams, they'll do an 18 bracket. So you have pool play on Saturday, but in Medford, uh, Lithium Driveway Fields, they do uh, two brackets, a gold bracket and a silver bracket, where you have your top four teams, and then the five through eight in the silver bracket, and then, you know, five plays eight, six plays seven, one plays four, two plays three. And so that, I understand why Mo, why Medford does it. They just want to limit, you know, to four games max. Whereas if you do the, have you ever played in a tournament with the eight bracket teams? Yeah, with our summer team, we we played a couple of Northwest Nations tournaments. Yes. And yep, and that's exactly the the layout. And we did play three games on a Sunday. Right. And that's I good. Think we were at the same tournament and it was a hundred degrees and the kids <laughs> were beat. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's fun because one thing about uh, what I like about the eight team bracket, eight uh bracket versus the four by four is that if your team has a lot of pitching which we had nine of our 12 kids last year pitching. So we were deep and we had three decent, really decent catchers. And so, um, which who also pitched. So when you get into that, what happens is you usually gold bracket championship games, uh, all the arms are usually tossed out, but by game five and you're in the bracket championship, you're, you're, it's, it's a hit fest. It's a run fest. It, uh, so I, yeah, no, it, it, it's fun. I, it's just, uh, it's just travel baseball and there's different ways to do the brackets. And I thought that was great. Um, Hey, in my, uh, in my podcast, I'm always going to a- ask this question, um, to travel baseball coaches. And it's just a thoughtful question because it was one that really hit me last year, um, real hard. And, um, it's, it's this, uh, Patrick, is there something that made you step back while well, being a coach for this 10 U team? that the players taught you? Yeah. So, I mean, I, it's easy for a travel baseball coach to focus just on the baseball things. Mm. Um, it's, it's the impact that we're going to have on these young men's lives long-term. That's even more important. I think uh, one of the parents called me in the off season and said, Hey, my son who played played for me last year uh oddly enough he had you on his list to invite you to his birthday party (laughs) and i was like oh okay but then but then it it, i paused real quick and i'm like man he he played for me for two seasons moved on up to the next age group now um but he he thought of me and it made me realize that there's this impact that you're leaving on these young men that um, is so much more profound than just fielding a ground ball. And so right. sometimes pausing and realizing that everything you say and do on the baseball field is setting an example, whether it's the way you interact with an umpire, whether it's the way you interact with the other kids, the parents, the respect factor, all that, that that's all part of our job as baseball coaches, besides right. just the baseball stuff. Oh, that's so a that, good one. That, that's, what, that's what sticks with me. Yeah. I mean, so... I'm thinking like 15, 20 years from now, you know, seeing those kids again and what they remember of us doing what we, what we've done for them in both positive and negative ways. Cause you don't know how somebody's taking anything. Everybody's personality is a little bit different, but I look forward to those. That was a good one, man. That was, that was awesome. Um, <laughs> was there anything that a player has done um, while you're coaching, like during practice or a game or anything? And just kicked you right out of coaching mode to where you just had to uh, stop and laugh. Oh, man. Um, The only thing that I can think of was we were doing crossfire, which is the standard ground ball drill. And you got two coaches, one hitting a second, one hitting a short, right? And, Right. and, And they're both running and dropping it in a wagon we had sitting on second base. And one of the kids, not even thinking, threw it at one of our coaches who was just standing there. It, it drilled him right in the man area. Oh, jeez. 
and the coach is doubled over the kid is like bright red like you he immediately knew he messed up right and the entire team is just dying like we lost all control of practice like, right no it, no no it, it, oh and it was just it it, it was pretty funny but yeah uh, yeah it, no it, that's it, exactly what i'm talking about is stuff like that it's just because you know coaching we're always like uh we have this season ahead of us and there's light at the end of the tunnel. And that's the end of the season. Right. And in this tunnel are these objectives. You want to get your team by throughout the season. We want to finish this. We want to finish this. We want to get all, like 11. You we're going to start bunting this year. We didn't bunt at all. Uh, the two 10 years that we played um, mm-hmm. just because we want them to learn just swing, 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 swing. Right. And so we've been practicing bunting last year, but we just didn't do it in a game except for Eli. Eli is a left, even fast. And so I'll have him drop a bunt left and right. But uh, I'm talking more like situational bunting, you know, getting somebody over to third, a first and second bunt, um, put the ball down, move them both over to second and third. Okay, now one out. Let's see what we can do on a close game. Because uh, normally the games, they typically aren't close one way or the other, where we're winning or they're winning. It's just, it's, it's, it's a blowout. So, um, so yeah, so for us, it's all these different obstacles in the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but, uh, is there something this year that you want to make sure that you get, you teach the boys by the end of this season? You know, um, geez, let me think on that for a second. Well, what is something that your team doesn't do very well right now? You know, we still haven't turned double play. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> ground ball double play, <laughs> and and I I think that's really hard if any team is getting any kind of lead at first and and they're doing any kind of decent job base running. Um, I'd love to see that happen. We've got a great right. second short combo um, that that I think is capable of it, and they work on that um, the transition and everything through. Yeah. But, we still haven't gotten the, the traditional the, double the, play, the, not the, the line point. drive double off or the unassisted no. shortstop going towards second step on the bag over to first. Yeah. No five, four, three, yeah. six, four, three, four, right. six, three, double. Plays. Right. Nothing. None of that. Yeah. Or better I, yet. I, one, uh, one, six, three. Yeah. That yeah. we haven't done yet. <laughs> Pop turn, throw it. Hopefully the short gets there and get them out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd um, be impressed if, if, if we could, ever pull off a one six three and ten you but yeah oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> absolutely no that'd be awesome um no hey that's all i have um is there anything you want to share that maybe we didn't cover yeah i mean the only thing i had for you is um obviously i've probably watched 20 of your team's games the, yeah the and i know when you're there ryan's right there on the other side of the fence. Yeah. I'm like, hey buddy how's it going uh, yeah, yeah he loves it i mean it, oh yeah he, he'd rather go watch a general's game than go play video games so I, I'm, I'm fine with it it's oh yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, um, so, when you're setting practice up and everything, it's it's hard sometimes to gauge because the t- the kids all grow at a different level. And say you're teaching things, how much reinforcement are you doing before you move on? And what I'm saying by that is, um, you know, you could touch on getting good jumps at first base for 12 practices in a row, and some kids still aren't quite there. But how? How, how long do you go until you move on to the next step of um, working on that secondary or working on um, messing with shortstop and second and getting good leads off of there and pushing shortstop off the bag by taking a lead backwards, things, taking it to the next level. Um, what, what's your gauge as far as do, do the kids have to master something before you reinforce it or what, what's your, what's your metric there? Well, everybody wants to be on the same level field as their teammates. And so um, in nine U, uh, our first year 10 U, I guess, um, there were kids that knew how to steal. Okay. We probably had four or five. All right. They were pretty good. And they, they, since they know how to steal, they understood the purpose of the game. So for me, what I did is I, t- I was a base stealer. I was fast and you always steal the base off the pitcher. Rarely do you steal it off the catcher unless they're just, they don't have an arm. They're slow, that kind of stuff. But imagine you had, you know, um, Ivan Rodriguez. Okay. Blast from the past. You don't steal on Ivan Rodriguez. All right. You steal on the pitcher. And so what I do is I teach the, I taught the boys that this was the best ultimate game of tag in the world. 
is that you're going from this base to that base without getting tagged. And this also doubles for when they're in a pickle because their brain gets set up just right to realize this is a tag and I need to get safe. So, so they're not pressured to get to the next bag. They're just pressured to get back to the back, the bag. So to answer like the, the secondary leads, the kids aren't getting the lead off or whatever. I, I teach a standard right, left, square, shuffle, shuffle. And so the reason for that is when I was taught that by Dave Gasser, the Oregon high school's most winningest coach was my uh, coach from so, uh, sophomore, junior, senior year. And before that was Royce McDaniel. And he's up there in the hall of Oregon hall of fame as well. Um, but Dave Gasser taught me this is that you st- I've always stared at the pitcher's feet when you're getting off the bag. Otherwise you're going to get picked, but he goes, it's right, left, square, shuffle, shuffle. And you take two you know, regular steps, you square up and you take a shuffle, shuffle. And the purpose of that is so when you do it enough times, when you, when you're staring at the feet and you do your normal right, left, square, shuffle, shuffle, you just know you t- pivot if you're getting picked off and push and dive and you're back to that bag. Now, if they're blown past that bag, they need to either take longer shuffles or longer strides, but they need to figure out how to get to that one spot. I can look over at first and I'll know if one of my players isn't off far enough. And I'll be like, give me a half, give me one. And and they'll know exactly what it is. Um, And so, which is nice from the third base coach perspective, because I can see, right. Mm -hmm. And then um, I said that everybody on the team wants to be on the same playing field. So as we were going through um, them taking their leads, once they got their leads down, that's fine. The hardest thing is teaching them the secondary, uh, the secondary lead, which is it's not a up and down, up and down, up and down, but it is three hops where you're landing on your right knee slightly behind your left knee. And you're either crashing to bounce back to your original lead or you're rolling over it to go to second base because the ball went down or, it went past the catcher, right? Um, so if they don't master the secondary lead, then it, at nine you, okay? So a lot of these kids w- wouldn't have been able to steal anyway. Um, I didn't give them the green light. So uh, what I'll do is I'll watch the pitcher-catcher combo, and I'll be like, all right, top four, green light, seven, or, you know, and I'll use kids' names. I'm just using hitting position. Seven, 10, you, green lights. Everybody else? If I give you the sign, then you steal. Well, that creates a competitive nature. Like, I want the green light. How come you didn't give me the green light? And then all of a sudden, it's like, hey, do you want a green? So when I go through teaching that again, I go, do you want a green light at the next game? They're like, oh, yeah, because uh, they don't want to be left out. And so that doesn't always work out that way. But after two or three of those practices, hey, do you want a green light? I've had kids come up to me. Can you give me a green light on this picture? I think I can, I know, you know, and I'm just like, no, you, you haven't demonstrated in practice what I, I need you to do in the game. Otherwise they're going to throw you out. And, you know, even at that level, they're not going to, I mean, the ball could be up the line. It could be bounced over their head or, or whatever. So there's, there's that error too, for them to be safe. But at, at the same token, not, I go, not unless we're blowing them out. I mean, you get that eight, eight run lead, eight or more run lead, then, then everybody gets a green light because mm-hmm. I want them to have that game, game time experience, but they didn't earn the green light. The team earned the green light. That's the end of episode one for travel baseball coach Justin. The Zoom meeting cut us off at the 35-minute mark. Anyway, stay tuned for episode two. I will make sure I have the Zoom meeting set for two hours, and that won't happen again. Thank you for watching. Travel baseball coach Justin. Have a good day.